Toastmasters is going to redefine how we do body language in the little itty bitty box on Zoom. You have tuned into and are viewing the District 96 Toastmasters website. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Picture here and what we've got is, this is what we're going to talk about, building your presence on Zoom. And today what we're going to do is look at five tips. Can everybody see that, five tips? All right, five tips we're gonna cover that are basic. And in fact, I'm gonna say they're actually essential if you were looking to build your presence, increase your leadership component when you're speaking in the virtual world. For the next 50, 60 minutes, I've divided the session into two parts. The first part, and the part that'll take up the most, is we're gonna talk a little bit about sitting and speaking in meetings. For most of us, these tips are so applicable because most of us spend our time sitting. We're sitting in a meeting regarding work, we're sitting in a meeting for Toastmasters. And then the second part, we're gonna look at what is it to stand and deliver a presentation? What are some of the things that you can do again to build your presence? And in this second session a portion, what we're going to do is look at two of the international speech contestant winners. Toastmasters just in August had the World Championship of Public Speaking. And we're going to look at Linda Marie Miller. She plays second. And we're going to look at the first place winner as well. So, and then what we're going to do is have a Q&A. So all your questions, if you've got them, fellow Toastmasters and our guests from Montreal and anybody else, ask them at the end. And then, of course, for the wrap up, what is your action plan? The action that you're going to put into place, maybe one of the tips you're going to take from today, from maybe what we've talked about in this meeting or what somebody has brought up, and you're going to put it into practice the next time you find yourself speaking in the virtual in the virtual world, which is for us going to be maybe later on today or tomorrow. So I see that some people, I just admitted somebody. So folks, any questions so far as we're rolling along here? And I'm gonna go with good speed because we have a fair amount to cover. And if you find that you want me to slow down as much as I can, I'm trying to take you all in by looking at the camera. Every once in a while, I'll glance at the screen and maybe Mimi or somebody else can help me and say, woohoo, you know, there's somebody that says you're going too fast, slow down, you're the pony on the racetrack, and just kind of wave your hand like this if you want me to slow down. Question, how many people, hands up, have heard of Amy Cuddy? Woohoo, Amy Cuddy. All right, well, a few of you, I see your hands are up. Amy Cuddy is a, a uh, oh my goodness, she, she's a, a, she deals, you know what, I just went brain dead, brain dead and talking to a whole bunch of people. But basically what she is, is she's a sociologist. And what she does is she studies people and body language. That's her specialty. And what she did is she gave a TED talk in 2012 that was titled, Your Body May Shape Who You Are. If you haven't watched it, if you haven't gone on to see the 2012 TED Talk that Amy Cuddy gives on your body may shape who you are, I really encourage you, it's 18 minutes of time really well spent. But in this session, in this, this, this uh, presentation that she gives and the TED Talk, she says that we're all fascinated by body language. And all we have to do, of course, is to go into a bookstore or go see movies or whatever it is, and we, it's true, we find out from ourselves, we're fascinated about really how people interpretate us. We're fascinated about how we watch other people and we make decisions based on what we think they mean. And she goes on to say that with this fascination, body language really is a form of communicating. And we know this from our own experience. We also know from our own experience that our body language can not only influence us how we feel about ourselves, but our body language also influences, it impacts how other people feel about us. And as I said, we know this to be true because from our own experiences, we know when we watch somebody walk, the way they sit, the way they hold themselves, their facial expressions, their eye contact. Are they looking at us when they're speaking? Are they downcast? Are they gazing about? Are they paying attention? We make decisions. We make a judgment about them. And in the real live workplace where we are, you know, where we used to be, we're not so much anymore, around the boardroom at a meeting, how we 
presented ourselves could really impact greatly on the performance review we got, the promotion we ended up receiving, or maybe how well our career moved forward. So body language does influence. So it's interesting. There are so many things about body language that we know. And yet when we get into the virtual speaking world and we're in this little tiny box and here I look out and I see a gallery view of little faces, some shoulders and some heads. What happens is sometimes we forget that the body language, the signals that we're sending out might not be the same as what we wanted to send out and we're not as conscious of it as we would be in a real live meeting. So I have a question right now that I'd like to pose to everybody. Well, before that, we're going to have breakout rooms. And in these breakout rooms, I'm going to ask people to do two things. Uh, Mimi will divide everybody into uh, breakout rooms, four people to a room, or it might be five, depending on what we've got, how many attendees we have. But there are two things. Number one, when you get into the breakout room, decide who has their birthday, their birthday closest to today's date, September 20. In fact, it may even be on today's date. That person whose birthday is the closest to today's date is going to be the one who's going to be the spokesperson for your group. That person will take what you discussed in the group and share it at the end when we come back from our breakout groups. Number two, the second thing here is, this is the question that I'd like everybody to discuss in the breakout group. And you'll have maybe maximum four minutes, Mimi. And the question is this, what's the difference what do you see is the difference between communicating in Zoom, in the virtual world, as opposed to communicating in person? What do you think is the difference? All right, right now we'll let everybody go to the breakout rooms. Mimi, I'll let you take them off into cyberspace and come back in about four minutes. What comes across here, I think, from what, generally speaking, from what people have said, is that, yes, what we've got here, we've got a wonderful tool in using virtual platforms, whether it's Skype, Zoom, we're on it right now, whatever that platform is, that offers us so much. The challenge is it does not offer us everything that is the same when we're meeting in person. And that, in a way, might be a growth for all of us. Because I too, I love speaking in person and I love it when I can look at people, I can move around the room, I can stretch myself, I can use my body language to the fullest, but that isn't available to me on this particular platform. So the next uh, five tips that we're going to talk about will cover some of the items that people mentioned. And does it mean now that there's a learning curve for many of us? Yes, there is. Does it mean that we have to take the extra step in terms of confidence in what we've put together that we really truly within ourselves feel that man I put my best foot forward I'm going to go out there I'm going to look at that camera and what's going to happen is I will have the expectation that I will have done my very best and get the appropriate reaction and that is a leap of faith that we sometimes need and I'm going to say in speaking on a virtual platform like Zoom because it's important that we look at the camera. Yes, I'd like to look at all the little boxes, but if I look at the boxes, then I'm not looking at you. So it's a leap of faith. So of these five tips, when we're looking in this little itty bitty box, there are five little points that I'm going to expand on in the next, you know, maybe 10, 11 minutes. Tip number one is sit up straight and shoulders back. Oh, sounds like you've got a teacher or a parent telling you, sit up straight and shoulders back. But there's a reason for that. The reason for that is when you sit up straight and you put your shoulders back, what you're doing is you're opening up your rib cage. And when you open up your rib cage, you're letting your lungs expand to bring in more air. And we need that air. If we have any level of stress or nervousness, what that oxygen does, it goes to the brain, it helps our brain work better, we our cognitive functions become sharper, and it also lets us and helps us relax more the more oxygen we bring in. Plus, when we sit straight and our shoulders are back, you know, we look more confident. We look at ease, we look at engaged, and we look as if we are participating in what's going on. 
Now, years ago, I remember when I was in school, and I've been in school many years ago, a lot of you are considerably younger, you know, in typing, that was one of the rules. The teachers said, you got to sit up straight and shoulders back. Nowadays, many of us, when we're working at our desks and we have our meetings, because we're so engrossed, we let our bodies drop, we begin to slouch, our ribcage contracts, and then we're not breathing the way we could breathe to bring out what we could bring out when we're communicating on Zoom. Now, I know there's probably somebody that's saying, mm, I want to sit with my arms crossed and I'm going to slouch and I'm going to do it so there. And you know what? That's okay. That's up to you. Because the big thing here when it comes to body language is you may be thinking you're feeling a certain way and that's fine. But the key thing here when we're talking about body language and building your presence in the virtual, on the virtual platform, in the virtual world, is what signal are you sending out? When people are looking at you, what are they seeing? What decision are they making about you that can impact your relationship with them? Do you come across as credible, as confident, as strong, as confident? as kind of in control and that you are attentive. And I'll leave that to you to decide because you may feel how you feel, but it may be the other person that might be making the decision about whether or not they're going to work with you or whatever they're gonna to decide to do with you in this particular context. Now that didn't quite come out right, what they're gonna do with you. But anyway, let's skip that. Let's move forward. That was supposed to be funny. I'll just move on. So posture is really critical. Tip number two, gestures. Now, it's been brought out that we are looking and communicating in a box. And so, yes, it really is confining. For me, I tend to love. I love using my hands. I love using my arms. But I learned the lesson the hard way. About a month ago, I was having a meeting with somebody on Zoom, and I could see the person shortly after we started our conversation. Her facial expression changed. She looked like she was getting irritated. And then all of a sudden, she just shouted out, Stop, Dorothea, just stop it. You're driving me crazy. You're making me seasick. And I'm like, do what? And she said, you're, you're waving your arms back and forth too much. Because I was talking about something I was so excited and I was moving my hands and I was going back and forth like this and I was up and down and all over the place. And I had no idea because I was engaged in just expressing myself, forgetting that I'm actually speaking on a platform that has me in a little itty bitty box. So I've now become very aware of when I'm using my hand gestures and somebody might say, well, that means you can't express yourself fully. You can express yourself fully. It just means we're now learning to adapt, to express ourselves in a different way. Maybe it wasn't necessary for me to wave my hands. Maybe that was more distracting. And if I don't move or do something with a purpose, something that helps describe, emphasize, maintain, elaborate what I'm talking about, then I don't need any body language, any gestures here whatsoever. Then I'm best just to leave my hands down and talk and express through my facial expressions. The other thing, and this also was mentioned by somebody in Zoom, that it's difficult because many times we just see the head. If you're planning on building a presence, I'm going to suggest that what you do is take your upper body, your torso, so here from the head, maybe down to below where the rib cage is, and bring this portion of you on camera. And there are reasons for doing that. The one reason is that it shows more of you. You are more of a presence than just a little head on a screen. And I'm going to move my hand just a little bit of a head on a screen here. You can also use more of your body now to express and elaborate on what you want to say. Now, having said that, I'm also going to say that to make sure when you're using your body language, your hands for movement, is not to go outside the screen, to keep everything kind of fully together in this one little square. We call it a body square. And I'm also going to encourage you to show more of yourself than just your head for the simple reason that sometimes when we get excited, what happens is we have little fingers popping up here. And there's nothing wrong. No one's going to run you out of town or you know, ship you off on an iceberg. But what this does is it is a bit of a disconnect. So once I come down and I'm bringing my, putting my laptop down, now you can see when I want to make a point or I want to do something or show you, now my arms and my hands and my fingers are all attached and it's like all part of me. So it's just a different way of looking and of 
moving with someone as we're listening and watching them present in this little box. So our gestures. The other thing I'll say about gestures, and I did this earlier, you may have seen me, I moved my face really close to the screen because I have something I want to share with you. Now, I think that is great when people do that for emphasis. However, it's a bit distracting if a person goes, and I said yesterday, and now I'm coming back, and I'm going, it was so nice to meet everybody. And once in a while, I'll find somebody that what they're doing is they're going back and forth into the screen, and that ends up being a distraction. Or you're using your arms. Again, something I have to learn on Zoom. I would go like this, and what happens when my hand comes close to the camera? It's like a whoop, a massive hand staring you in the face, and something that nobody needs. So again, gestures, keeping them kind of confined, and it's just learning how to work with them. And I'm gonna say, ask yourself, the gestures that I want to make, are they purposeful? Are they descriptive? Will they help what I'm talking about? Or are my gestures not going to be appropriate? And if they're not, what can I do? What can I learn how to make them so? Tip number three, when we're looking at our facial expressions, and this includes eye contact. So our facial expressions, how many of us are aware of our facial expressions? What is the face we carry with us? I am sure that some of us would be absolutely shocked if we saw ourselves on camera, maybe rushing through traffic or being at the grocery store, running late or having something happen and it's a stress to us because we think sometimes our face, we've got it under control, but our face is telling other, other stories. Facial expressions, for example, I had to learn, this is another lesson I learned, this was a few years ago, I was taking a night school course, and there I am, I'm sitting in the class, and one evening the instructor comes, and the instructor looks at me, he stops what he, the lesson, and he looks at me and he goes, Dorothea, what's wrong? And he comes closer and he goes, oh, you look really upset. What's wrong? And I went, wait, what? what? Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong at all. And he said, oh, you look really, really. And all of a sudden, I realized at that point, it's not that this hadn't been mentioned to me before about me looking upset. But at that point, I realized that when I focused in, when I concentrated on something, what happened is I had this, well, you can't see it, but it's like a oh, real frown. I'm intense. And I realized after that, that I really had to be more cognizant of what signal is my face sending. So if you're wondering, well, I've got hair all over my face or bangs, that's why, because this is covering my frown line right here. But our facial expressions on Zoom, we're limited many times that this is the only way we can send a signal out and maybe with our posture to the other person to help them make a decision about us. And I would say, don't underestimate what your face tells other people. At a Toastmasters meeting the other morning, we had somebody in charge of the meeting, ran a great, great meeting, but when other people were speaking, was sitting back and had a look similar to this on their face throughout the entire meeting. And that look sent a signal of not being interested, not being engaged, there, it costs us nothing to be cognizant of just even having a little curl on our lips and having a smile in our eyes and looking like, oh, wow, this is really cool. This is really great. I think this is really interesting. And show that facial expression accordingly. Our eye contact. Yes, it's a big disconnect. Absolutely. Because if I'm looking at your little boxes right now and looking at you on the screen and trying to get your facial expressions, your reactions, I am not looking at you in the camera. And so this is where for all of us, this is where preparation comes in and the leap of faith that you're gonna give the best bang for the buck that you can. If you're at a meeting at work and somebody's asking you for a comment or you're, you're answering a question, that you have that leap of faith that you've done the research and you're gonna give it the best and with your facial expressions in your eyes, you're gonna give that response and you're gonna look at the camera. Now, I've also noticed today already that there are some people who are looking down at the camera and then there are other people who are looking up. The camera, try to make it at eye level. Your video cam or whatever you've got, position it so that it is at eye level. 
And that way, you know, it, it, it just makes it easier for everybody. I mean, make sure that you've got your lighting, you know, as much as you can, correct. It's something that I'm always working on myself. So eye contact, our eyes are the windows of our soul and our, and our face is, our eyes are inside our face. So these are two crucial areas for us to do really communicate effectively. We know this when we speak in person, there's no exception. When it comes to speaking on Zoom, the same, the same rule applies, the same tip applies. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is use of space. We all have our use of space. We're working at home now. And some of us have a really nice office space with bookshelves and everything. Other people have a green screen. And so what they do is they have a background. And other people have what we call the, the computer with a virtual screen. And they set up the virtual screen. I'm going to say if your virtual screen is stable, if when you move, that screen doesn't have you bleeding into it, then that's great. But if you have a virtual screen and you go, as long as you're sitting stationary and looking at the camera and you can just see a little shadow around the hairline usually, I mean, that's okay. But if you have to do any kind of movement, stand up, sit down, do whatever, and you're bleeding into that screen, drop it. I just, that is totally distracting. It's distracting for the viewer. And it's also unprofessional to have you stand up and do a presentation and half your body is missing because of this virtual screen not being totally stable. And that's something that I just, I really drives me bonkers, but nevertheless, that's me and, and I get driven bonkers quite easily. So I think in terms of space, the other thing is, is not to have something that causes people to be distracted. Yes, in the work world, when we're in person, there are distractions that happen in our meeting room, in the boardroom. But somehow that ambience, that energy that's there, we can still maintain our focus. When there's something that's happening in a space behind us, it might be family, could be pets, could be something else happening. Those little distractions really have a big impact in this little itty bitty box that we're speaking or communicating from because now they are impacting everybody because they see the same thing. In a work environment, not everybody might see the same thing. So our, our space is, is, is uh, really critical. And something I think here that happens to, I, I'm going to say in terms of space, is sometimes people are using the chat box and this box pops up and different things are going on. I will say also do that with care and, and with caution. The last thing here, the last point, number five, is etiquette. There are basic rules of etiquette that we have when we're speaking in person, people to people, when we're around the board and play table. And I'm gonna say much of that applies also when we're on Zoom. And that means having respect and courtesy. Sometimes people, what they'll do is they'll join in and, but they won't have their video on. And what will be is they'll have their picture or something else on. And it might be like we have for Tim, there's something wrong with his video, he can't get through. It might be for somebody else that there's an emergency that's going on. But when that happens, unless the person knows that there is a problem with the video, what we get the feeling of is that somebody's there, but they're not really there. So for when we're showing our pictures and we're here and we're participating, we get the sense that there's 100%, I'm committed 100% to being here for whatever that time is. and and I'm going to give it my all. What happens if we only have this little picture there for the entire meeting or sometimes, and I've seen this happen also, where somebody will have two monitors and so the head turns to speak and answer a question when there's a discussion going on in the meeting room and then when that person isn't required, what they're doing is they're working on their other keyboard and doing other things or working on uh, their phone or whatever it is. Totally disrespectful. Would you do that if you were in person in a real meeting with your managers, your supervisors, with somebody else? Chances are, no, you wouldn't, right? So those are the tips that, what, you know, when we're talking about being effective, we can be effective in this little box. The more of us that we show uh, being uh, letting ourselves be seen, it can be more effective. And so I, I'm going to say right now, I'll probably wrap this up. But, you know, just looking in terms of our posture, looking in terms of our gestures, how we're moving, looking in terms of our facial expressions and our eye contact, the use of space. What does our office space look like? And just following rules, simple rules of graciousness, of respect and etiquette can make a big difference. 
showing that we are attentive, I think is probably one of the most important things that we can do. And that is one sign of showing respect. So I think this is the first portion that I wanted to just cover in terms of the tips. One of the downsides is we can't feel the energy. We can't feel the ambience of the room. So this now becomes more of an onus on us as the presenters to build our own energy and to hope that somewhere what we're doing is we're being able to somewhere through cyberspace transfer that in some way. And yes, maybe it's not so much in our body language, but through our facial expressions and the tone of our voice. And maybe it means we have to work more on vocal variety, on doing something and being a bit more bold in how we express ourselves. So right now, what I'd love to do is I'd love to show a couple of little clips and very short, maybe a minute and a half, a minute and 40 seconds on the winners of the international speech competition. And so what I'm going to do right now is go to screen share and we're going to put this audio share on and I'm going to hope that I get, here we go. Now, before we actually start this, here's a question for everybody. You're going to be seeing the second place winner, uh, Linda, and then you're going to be looking at the first place uh, uh, winner. And what I'd like you to do is, what is the difference? Look at how both of these people use the Zoom platform. Look how they both use the speaking platform that we've got, the virtual background. Linda Marie Miller, pretending not to know. Pretending not to know, Linda Marie Miller. If you're ready to change the world, but you don't know how, I have the key. It's just a question, but it's the most powerful question in the world. The question is, what are you pretending not to know? That question changed my life. What was I pretending not to know? I find out when I helped my friend Tony and his son Michael. Michael was not your typical teenager. Once, he convinced his father to let him bring a homeless boy into their house. Michael shared everything with that young man and gave up his own bed until that boy got back on his feet. In college, Michael excelled. As a freshman, he tutored seniors in chemistry. He loved science. He loved so, science so much, he enrolled his professors and fellow classmates into assisting he him delivered a science he delivered experiment a science experiment for blind children for blind so that children. they could experience so that they the love, could of, science experience the love of science that he had. All right, we've looked a little bit at Linda's and now what I'd like to take you to is the person who won first place. So again, looking at how she uses her space to her advantage, now let's look at the winner and see what he does. Mike, Mike Carr, Carr, the librarian, the librarian and, Mrs. and Mrs. Montgomery. The librarian, the librarian and, Mrs. and Montgomery. Mrs. Montgomery, Mike Carr. I was spellbound as I watched the sheriff who had just been shot slide back, open that heavy metal door, stagger forward a couple of steps, look deep into the camera and say, I before E except after C. Contest chair, fellow Toastmasters, I was in the sixth grade in Mrs. Montgomery's class watching an educational video where a sheriff was teaching us about writing while a bad guy named Bad English was shooting at him. It was on a film projector because we were technology challenged in my school. And as I watched that film, all of a sudden something started looking strange. The film slowed down, and when it picked back up, it made a sound like tick, 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 and it looked like it was blinking. Then the sheriff was talking to us from the side of the screen. The blinking started again with a loud noise. Ooh, everything went blank. I ran to the front and I turned off the projector. I opened it up. Something smelled like it was burning. Mrs. Montgomery, I said, can I try to fix this? All right. So just generally some comments here. 
First place winner, Mike. Second place winner, Linda. How did they use the Zoom platform to their advantage? What we have here are people, two people who won, Linda and Mike, and they did two speeches that were totally, each did their own speech, and they were totally, totally different from each other. Todd mentioned something that was very interesting, is that what, and, and other people I think refer to that as well, is that when Mike used, Mike actually did a speech that spoke to the camera. So when we're talking here about how to communicate in this little itty bitty box, what he did is he used that box and he thought, how can I maximize and make a winning presentation? And what he did is he took and actually used it, turning it upside down, whatever way, anybody who's watched his speech, you know all the antics and all the things that he did to drive his message home. Was he entertaining? Yes. Did he drive his message home? Yes. Did he do something out of the box, in the box, so to speak? The answer is yes. When we look at Linda's presentation, which actually fits the Toastmaster criteria, and if we were on a stage, now this is the big question here, if we were speaking on a stage with two, 3,000 people seated, in this massive convention hall watching somebody and you're looking on the jumbotron that outcome might have been a bit different because linda is the one who would have been on the stage i don't know what kind of presentation mike would have given because chances are that presentation done the way it was done using the virtual world speaking in the virtual world could not have quite gone the same way when you're in person on a stage standing in front of a group of people speaking. So very interesting. And what it points out to me is that we have nowadays, we have two different ways of communicating. One, we still will be speaking in person. We still will be out there attending events and there still will be people speaking on a stage or you'll be speaking in a boardroom and meeting and we'll still be looking at the entire person and getting this energy and a sense of presence. But the idea of Zoom and speaking in the virtual world is not going to go away. The door has been opened and it's not ever going to go shut. So there are different ways now that we need to learn to enhance ourselves on this platform. Whatever way you can find, depending on your work situation, the tips that we talked about today, they all apply to speaking on Zoom. And I'd like to wrap up before we get into the question period, wrap up with something going back to Amy Cuddy. Amy Cuddy in one of her quotes makes reference to somebody who did research watching 184, 185, 86 videos of people who were looking for venture capital. They were looking for money. So these venture capital presentations. And what the researcher found was the person who got the money, the person who got the money wasn't the person with the best credentials, wasn't the person with the best pitch. The one who got the money had the traits of being confident, being totally comfortable in their own skin and having passionate enthusiasm for what they're doing. Now we can translate that on a screen. We may not get the feedback that we do in real life, but this is where the confidence comes in and the belief in our own abilities of what we're capable of and the comfort level we have of being on our own skin and knowing that, yes, I need to approve myself and feel good about myself before I can expect you to feel a comfort level and feel good about me. So it really means that I got to do a lot more growing and self-accepting and not rely so much on the outer world. And the other thing about having passionate enthusiasm, you know, that just is something that is contagious, whether or not I can feel it from you, but I'm certainly hoping that somewhere that enthusiasm through the eyes, through the tone, through leaning into the screen will be translated. How we do it, whether we follow something that's more, I'm going to say, sophisticated and professional in manner like Linda, or whether we follow through and do something that is more kind of off the beaten track kind of crazy like Mike, that depends on our own personality. But I'll leave it to you and ask you, what action step are you gonna take now from what we've covered about today? What people, all of you have shared to put into practice the next time you find yourself speaking in the virtual world. 
So right now I'm going to toss this over to Yuri and I'm going to toss it over to me. Actually, I'm going to toss it all over to you. It's all in your bailiwick and ask you if you have any questions. And Yuri, I'll let you take care of that. In, in few words would be, okay, from my understanding is that we tend to talk over people because we don't know who turns it is. How do you manage that? Ah, okay. So, That's basically in, in, what it is. so the, the question is, how do you manage so not everybody talks at once? That's correct. Okay. I, I guess that would basically mean whoever is in charge of the meeting, and I will assume that most times when we're in Zoom, that there's somebody in charge of a meeting. Even if we have an informal meeting, there'll be somebody who initiated it, sent out the link, and then it would be up for that person to say, you know, why don't we all go on mute? And then when it's your turn to speak, or, you know, when you feel you've got something to speak, and I think Mimi or somebody had mentioned, put up your hand, and then take that person and everybody else still be on mute. It's a learning, it's a learning situation. And I find uh, even in my Toastmasters club, we sometimes forget. So at the beginning of the meeting, the person has, we all have to be reminded, be on mute unless it's your turn to speak or unless you are asked to speak. And then again, sometimes the chair or the Toastmaster has to remind people throughout the meeting. So I, I hope that helps somewhat. Yeah. But it, 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 it's, it's an instruction and it's taking, somebody has to take charge, somebody has to give the instruction and then follow through that it's done consistently. Because once you let one person interrupt, then you've opened the door. So you have to be very strict the first few times you initiate and do that. Prior to COVID, we teach people to use lots of gestures. And when we reduce our gestures to make it more effective in the virtual reality, Sometimes evaluations would say, you're not using enough gestures. Um, how can we get the message across around how much gestures is appropriate in the Zoom environment? Oh, thanks, Carrie. How uh, do we uh, monitor our gestures? What's enough, what's not enough? For starters, I'm going to say that my feeling is that when we get some of these instructions from Toastmasters, like the basic communication manual, the, the competent communicator manual, and now going through pathways, what Toastmasters does is it gives us guides in terms of body language and voice to help us build our confidence. As we become more confident, we kind of self-discover who we are. And there may be some people who are very effective with their voice who may not need to do body language. And I've heard people give excellent presentations. And I'm going to use Linda as an example. She used body language, very controlled, but there wasn't a lot of it. It was very defined. Now, there might be somebody who looks at her and goes, wow, you should be using more body language. No, for her, for what she was talking about, it was very appropriate. Now, I am going to do this right now. It's, it's, um, and I'm sorry, this is going to be a bit rough. For me, when I do a presentation, I normally sit. However, I have got to challenge myself to stand up and speak. Since I want to be at eye level with you, what I need to do is take a box that I got from the liquor store and I need to put it down. And now what I need to do is I need to come up here and speak. Now, all you can see is, you can just see my, my head. I'm gonna turn this camera down and now, as I'm moving backward, now I'm going to be, for me, Carrie, if I want to say, hi, how's everybody today? I'm so happy to meet you. All right, I might be doing this and it might be appropriate or not, but this is kind of my style. I like to move. Speaking here on Zoom, I realize that if I want my message to have impact, I have to decide for myself, what am I going to use that's going to help drive that message home? If it's all kinds of body language, great. If my message is something that doesn't require a lot of body language, maybe I need to rethink how I'm going to employ body language. And I wouldn't be surprised if as time goes on and we do more meetings in the virtual world, that Toastmasters is gonna to redefine how we do body language in the little itty bitty box on Zoom, right? I think this is a big learning curve for all of us. And I don't think there's a magic, I wish I had a magic answer, Carrie. I'd write a book. I'd be on Oprah if she's still around. I'd be doing something somewhere, right? But I don't have an answer for you. Sorry, Carrie. 
it was an absolute treat. I hope it's been helpful. I think Toastmasters will be coming out with something for helping us in this little itty bitty box. And I just want to leave you with this. The qualities, the traits that got people the money, got them to go where they needed to go. Remember, confidence, feeling at ease, and enthusiastic about what they're talking about. Those are things that we can deliver, whether we're in a box, you know, in a flower bag, or in person, it doesn't matter. Away we go. My pleasure and great afternoon to you all. You have tuned into and are viewing the District 96 Toastmasters website. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel.